going to uh, run through uh, several things today. I kind of feel like uh, after many years of studying and preaching that understanding the Old Testament is helped by knowing the New Testament and understanding the New Testament is helped by knowing the Old Testament because it lays the, the foundation and uh, helps us to understand some aspects of what Jesus was saying. I just want to do is a lot of this is um, I don't know what you'd call basic. What is the difference between biblical and rabbinic Judaism? The reason I th- I'm just piecing together several different you know I got like 80 slides in these two classes and we're doing all of them in one day so <laughs> we're skipping some of them. So. Uh, The word Tanakh is the Hebrew Bible, which was traditionally believed to be written mostly by Moses and then some of the prophets. Uh, Samuel is considered to be one of the authors of the Hebrew Bible, as well as Moses. It was completed by the second century. But what happened in the second century is uh, Israel was carried away into captivity by uh, particularly Judah, and there, there was no longer a temple. You know, it was destroyed, and there was no longer the priesthood. It was destroyed. So when they went into uh, diaspora, uh, as they were spread out across the world, that's when the whole rabbinic or rabbi movement started, and they became the leaders uh, of the, the gatherings, and the teachings after the second, the 200 years before Christ, switched over to the rabbis were in charge, and we still are familiar with that term today. I mean, even the disciples said something about uh, rabbi to Jesus. They saw him as a teacher. Uh, the Talmud is the Hebrew word, compendium of Jewish law and lore, tradition after dispersion. So after they came back together, then they looked for the local gathering. Um, evolving teachings and traditional practices. What happened also under the rabbinic period of time, and as I understand, lots and lots and lots of rules were written. And they were written down. And they have continued many of those practices. But they weren't really in the original um, time period coming out of Egypt and the establishment of the Hebrew church. I have uh, a lot of different slides here to try to skim through today. Abraham, who was Abraham? What's he got to do with this whole story? What'd you say? Go ahead. He was, he was the beginning of the covenant. God made a covenant with Abraham. And you remember the practice there in Genesis where they, they separated, a, what was it, a calf and, other, and two sides, and God walked through the midst of it. So that blood covenant was established. And so Abraham was foundational. And it's suggested between 1700 and 1900 years before Christ. The Pentateuch, what's a Pentateuch? Pentateuch is five, the original, and they are Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. You bet. Those we still look at and draw a lot of uh, understanding from. I really didn't want to spend any time talking about the two creation stories. Today, scholars kind of divide Genesis 1 and Genesis 3. it's like Genesis 3, to me, just kind of expands on what's in, in what happened in Genesis 1. And, and the Garden of Eden and Tree of Life are all outlined there, um, <clears throat> going clear back to Adam. So, covenant. The covenant is, uh, if you remember last week, we were talking about monotheism. What's that? One God. Who did we talk about last week? Islam. 
one God, monotheistic. I'm not exactly sure, uh, and it's become, the, the phrase is here, called the chosen people. You ever heard that phrase? The Jews are the chosen people? Is that a compliment? Has that been beneficial or sometimes a hindrance? It's beneficial, but what ha- why do so many people dislike them? You know, it's kind of tossed around as a very sarcastic phrase, but you're, so you're the chosen people. What does it leave the rest of us? Sort of re, as read into that. And I think that's my personal opinion. I think that has helped foster this dislike that still exists today. Uh, so there are all these covenants here, and Noah and the great flood. God continues to intervene in history. Abraham, example of obedience to God. Sarah, his wife. Hagar. Sarah's servant, how does she play into Islam? (laughs) Hagar was a servant, wasn't she? That Sarah gave to Abraham because she couldn't bear him a child. You know, that was a pretty big deal back then. If you couldn't deliver a child, you were pretty close to useless, you know, in that way, in in that fashion. Honestly, could you find that kind of thinking in tribes in Samburu and Turkana today? Sure you could. A male child has more value than the the female child and all that. That's that's not completely been eradicated, okay? Um, Isaac, son of Abraham and Sarah, and what was his original name? Jacob. Son, and the willingness to sacrifice Isaac. That was been one that has been perplexing to people from time in memoriam. Why did God ask Abraham if he would sacrifice his son? And why did he go? He was going to go through with this. It's the way it's made to, to look in the scriptures. I mean, they had gathered the sticks, and he let the son carry the sticks. He was going to sacrifice him on. And uh, but it proved that he was able, and and very absolutely he was who he said he was. He was obedient. Now, uh, now we sit and we theorize about that and say, well, he didn't really mean for him to do it. Well, we'll never know. <laughs> but it also showed that he his faith was great enough to believe what God had told him to do. Um, Israelites went down to Egypt because of the famine. Who was the uh, leader down there once they got into Egypt? Genesis. Joseph? He was the son that had been sold into slavery because the other sons didn't like him because he held out the fact that dad liked him better than he did like the rest of them. So he made, made him a multicolored coat or cloak, and uh, so they wanted to get rid of him. Um, <clears throat> okay, there's so many different aspects that we're familiar with in these stories of the Old Testament. First temple of Jerusalem was built by David wanted to build it and he kind of laid the groundwork but God said because of your sin you will not but your son will who was Solomon he ended up building the first temple David wanted to do it real bad as a, as a gesture of his devotedness to God but there was a price to pay for his sin and what was his sin Bathsheba, yeah, and he let her husband be killed and set it up so he was killed. Uh, I think that's a good example of to be reminded that none of us are perfect, isn't it? Nobody's perfect, and God is able to work with us, 
And God is able to offer salvation, but he also expects a change, I think, along the way. You don't continue to be a murderer, for example. Uh, and it's a very famous passage in Psalms where it says, uh, Isaiah, or Psalms 53, I believe it is, where, where David says, uh, pleading for God to forgive him and restore him into his relationship. That's, that's kind of a central teaching for preachers. Um, so in 722 BCE, exiled to Assyria to live among the non-Jews, the Gentiles. 586 BCE, Babylonians destroyed Jerusalem. Nineveh was the capital of, and they took northern, the northern ten tribes. They were taken out at that time, and then you had the uh, Babylonians attacking uh, Benjamin and uh, Jerusalem itself. The temple. A lot of things happened there. They were in captivity, what, 70 years? And that is when this, go back to the idea that the rabbis set up because they had to establish worship in all their places they go. Now, diaspora, that's a diaspora, diaspora, I don't know how you want to pronounce it. Diaspora. What does that mean? Diaspora. Dispersion? Okay, okay, good. It means they were spread out across the world. You can find Jewish history in all kinds of places across the Middle East and, and Asia because they were dispersed throughout the world. They weren't supposed to, but in some places they did. At one time, one of the prophets told them they had to get rid of those wives when they were rebuilding the temple after they had come back after the 70 years. Sounds pretty harsh, doesn't it? Somebody said a while ago, sometimes I take rabbit tracks off to the side a little bit. And what, it's a great question, what group of people today considered a, a very fast-growing church thinks they are part of those ten lost tribes? Well, uh, no. I would think that's very likely. Ethiopia had established a very strong uh, worship there in, in their capital. And we still, we're still digging out over there trying to find all the different things. Oh, the Mormon church. Part of their original teachings is they, they're part of the ten lost tribes. And that's why they were given special uh, interpretations, special books, and special leaders. I'm not saying I agree with all that, but I'm just saying that's the way it is looked upon. Um, Maccabean Rebellion, what is that? There were 400 years after they, after they came back that there was basically nothing going on in the way of leadership. And so there were the Maccabeans. This is a family that uh, rose up many different leaders. And they, they, people by that time were starting to think they were looking for that Messiah. And they declared one of them was going to be, he was the Messiah because he led battle against Rome and won a few times. But finally, Rome got annoyed enough with him. They sent in a whole army, and they uh, crucified several thousand to put that uprising down. That's all part of the history in that Maccabean period of 400 years leading up to the time of Christ. Okay. There's also some terminology in the New Testament that we see that started to show up in that period. The Sadducees with the priests and the wealthy business people with conservative intent. The Pharisees, 
liberal citizens from all classes, general movement of an uncompromising piety that included groups like the Ascendants. How do we connect to the Ascendants, Ascendants or Ascends today? And okay, John the Baptist, Ascends dressed in white robes, their library in the Qumran known as the Dead Sea Scrolls, 1948, was it? The Dead Sea Scrolls. One of the fascinating things about the Dead Sea Scrolls, they were found in little caves from 2,000 years ago. What they've got out of that, uh, and, and some of them are held in Great Britain's museum, and some are held in... in uh, uh, Jerusalem, but these manuscripts show that they are still the very same thing that were written over 2,000 years ago as to what we still are, have and use as Scripture. It, 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 ver it validated, validated what we see in the Old Testament. So uh, they figure prominently. Now, they were a people that withdrew from everything. They didn't hang out at the temple. They st stayed down in the, I don't know, what's, what part of that country is it today? Uh, but then, anyway, there's these little caves that were high up on the cliffs and hard to get to. And a little shepherd boy had thrown a rock or something into one of them and heard it hit something. And he crawled up there and got in it and found this treasure trove of ancient manuscripts. Very, very important to archaeology and history. Uh, okay, so we return to Jerusalem. It was at that time they were starting to write about apocalyptic literature. What's apocalyptic? End of time. Okay, so there's some of that's in the Ascendance Dead Sea Scrolls. And you saw that start to take a, a prominent place in our history. <clears throat> So apocalyptic literature talks about a, an end times and what might happen. Is anybody talking about that today? Yeah. Okay. So it's definitely still part of our language. This is all under Judea. Rabbis inherited the Pharisaical tradition. Hillel the ed, ed, elder, Pharisaic leader who was contemporary of Jesus. What was Paul? Apostle Paul, I'm going to throw that in there. What was his background? He called himself the Pharisee of the Pharisees. He says he was, he was dead on with what a Pharisee was, which means he had to have special education. And you read, you read, we read from his writings, he had to be a very intelligent person, well, well educated. Synagogue. Literally means meeting place. What do the Quakers refuse to call this building originally? A church. This is a meeting place. A place where people come together to meet. Literally. Minion. Anybody ever heard of a minion? Minion. You know, there, there are Jews all over. I, I had a student who was Jewish uh, at William Penn, and he said that he was from the uh, Davenport area, and they had a minion, which meant they had 10 male leaders. That takes a, a minimum of 10 in order to be established as an official uh, place of worship. Okay. Um, what screen am I on? I don't want that one. It's kind of helpful in history to remember that at one time Babylon was the center of Ju Judaism in the 10th century before Christ. And then in the 8th century, Baghdad, Baghdad was the center of Judaism. Very much so. And I don't know how to pronounce this last name, Mamon 
say that again? Maimonides. From Spain. Uh, at one time, there was a very strong contingent of Jews in Spain. Some of that is a little bit uh, spurred on by Paul making a little comment in the end of Acts how he intended to make it on west. And there is a tradition that he made it to Spain. Nobody could figure out exactly how he did that um, since he was in prison in Rome, unless he got, got out on a 90-day sabbatical or something. I don't know. But anyway, uh, Spain also then became, uh, I didn't talk about this last week, there was one time uh, the, the uh, majority of Spain had been taken over by the uh, Islamic people. They were actually pushed out, and uh, some people think that was wrong. One of the things I didn't mention in we think of today, and we see all the old movies about the uh, Muslim warriors, and they were very barbaric and so on. They actually ushered in, ahead of a lot of the rest of the world, written language, science, surgery, all kinds of things they were doing. It's kind of interesting to me that we may look upon as a whole group as a certain way, but is God able to find something good in just about any of us? Yeah, yeah. So sometimes when we start grouping everybody together and putting one label on them, we're shocked when we find out they're not like that when I got to know them personally. Okay. Um Bring us up to history a little bit. Six million Jews murdered by Nazi leadership of Germany during World War II. Reemergence of anti-Semitism in the 19th century, Western Europe. Uh, the Nazi party rose to power after World War I. Jews moved to ghettos and forced to wear the Star of David badges. Uh, 1942, Nazi leadership established the death camps and caused a whole reevaluation of theology at that particular time. So, um, we, what's going on today? Holocaust increased attention to Zionism. What is Zionism? When? Well, they were all just... They, <laughs> They were all dispersed out, all over. And one particular person uh, introduced, well, let's, I'm, I'm, let me put it down here. I can give you his name even. The idea that The idea that uh, there ought to be a, the homeland. And that was an idea that was prepared by a British fellow, and he promoted it. And the thing that allowed it to really happen, I, th I personally think, was World War II. And, and at the end of World War II, when the people saw what had happened as the attempt to completely annihilate the Jewish people, gave an opening to where they, a lot of the world said, enough is enough, let's give them their own home place. Well, we, what's going on over there right now? Theodore Herzl is a guy that organized this as a movement. I know people, it's the Balfour Declaration supported a national home for the Jewish people. I was on that board over there in Palestine for uh, two years, and one of, the, one of the members of that board, he sent me a video that to show me just how bad that Balfour institution declaration was and what it did to the Palestinian people that were living there. It wasn't pretty. I mean, they've been living there for several centuries without the Jewish. That's not entirely true because there's always been Jewish people there. They didn't always all leave. 
In fact, some of the Palestinians said, we, we lived here together. We got along fine. But then they set up this law and allowed uh, us to uh, be overtaken. And they unloaded the ships and they immediately went in and they pushed the people out of their houses and took their houses. And it was, it was very, very difficult. So... <clears throat> In 1947, the United Nations partitioned off Palestine. 1948, Israel declared independence. Wars with the Arab neighbors in 1948, 1967, and this thing is a little outdated. It was in 1973, and now we have one in 2023 and 24. Because there's a basic understanding is we need to uh, push them out in order for us to be to be who we're supposed to be, and we, we belong here, they do not. That's the basic thing underneath what's going on. And uh, it's very ugly. But if you, I had that opportunity to be over there five years ago and also to be with people who have suffered under all of this, and it is uh, very, very painful. We have the school there with 1,500 students. Most of the students are Arab or Palestinian. I had a professor down at William Penn keep telling me there, there is no Palestine. There is no Palestine. And finally I said to him, well, go ask the people over there if there's a Palestine or not. Because they think there's a Palestine because they've been there for several, a couple thousand years, you know, the Canaanites. So um, it's very difficult. Yet in the school, they make it work. There are Muslim teachers and there are Christian teachers in the same place. There's just certain areas they just don't go. They can't. It's illegal. So they don't. I mean, by that go, I mean in class. They, they can move about, but there's tension. There's always a tension. Um, Judaism today, I didn't go into the We, we need to uh, try to understand. That's my personal feeling. We need to try to understand the anguish and the difficulty that they've been living under for a lot longer than we've ever existed. So we need to have some compassion here and there and yon, but at the same time, I'm not for seeing people just be slaughtered like animals it's, it, it's it's a serious thing uh, I didn't go in try to go in to explain because I don't understand all of it the Orthodox Jews versus the conservative Jews or the reformed Jews it's, it's no different than the Christian church in some regards we have our different groupings and beliefs uh, the la when I flew over to uh, Tel Aviv in 2019, I'd never been in a place that was so heavily Jewish. We're flying over, I don't know, the Mediterranean, and the hour came for prayers. So all the men and boys, 12 and above, got up, and went to a corner or a spot where no one else was standing, leaning against the wall, and started praying in that plane. I'd never seen anything like it. And I thought, what's going on, what's going on? You know, I'm naive or simple or something. <laughs> and even the 12-year-old even the or 13-year-old boy, he, he had on his head hat his tails of his braided hair down, 
the dark or black suit. But everybody got up, and for, I don't know, it had to be an hour, they were praying. And I, as I read this and reread this this week, I thought, so how different is that than the Muslims insist on praying too at certain times of the day? So there's, there's some intertwining here that I don't understand all of it, but it's there as part of the culture. Um, <clears throat> Anybody have, all I'm trying to do today is whet your appetite or stir you up a little bit because there's no way we could go into everything. No, there's Messianic Jews. If they believe there's a Messiah. As a, as a, yeah, as a physical Messiah or it's all spiritual. So there are different beliefs within the system. Um, but, but as Christians, we have a heritage and we have a relationship in the Old Testament, don't we? Sure. Um, I think it behooves us to, the more we understand, if that's one thing that's done for me trying to teach this class, I, I don't know, I taught this class for three years. <laughs> Bob done di dug deeper <laughs> this time than I did for any of those classes. Maybe it's because I've done it enough times now, now it's starting to make sense. Well, I didn't show the slide. They, they obey the law. Obedience. There was a, there was a slide on that. I passed over it. Yes, sir. There's, a, there's an interesting phenomenon in New Mexico in this country. In New Mexico and in southern Colorado, there are a group of people who are considered to be what they call converso Jews. These are Jews that were in Spain. And during the Inquisition, the Jews in Spain went in two directions. They went north or south. They went south, they went through Portugal, came up, uh, came to Portugal, and then came to South America, and then eventually. These are people who outwardly are Catholic, but they certain practice, the families practice certain Jewish rituals. And the information was passed from one generation to another by through one sibling, so the father would pick one sibling oh, okay. and share. Colorado, who, who have Jewish heritage and they maintain certain rituals about covering the mirror when somebody died, certain things on, on right. And so, but they didn't realize what they were were doing because they were the rituals that were passed from one generation very quietly. And now, I mean, there's a very well-known Catholic priest who operates in, in, out of Albuquerque who has oh, really? clearly Jewish. And one of the ironic things out of the Inquisition is that they kept meticulous records. So some of these conversion Jews can go back 22 or 23 generations. So it's, it's sort of That's a long way. Yeah. And it's only been the last... Thank you. I don't think I'd heard all that. I do have a grandson that's somehow another in 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 lives in Altoona. That uh, his brother-in-law introduced him to some modification to Jewish Christian, and I I have not tried to inquire my, very much because I don't want to create a, a separation but they they don't go to church I mean they have their own little house church this information has split families I mean they 
have been families in which that it's come to light and half the family rejects it, the other family embraces it. Yeah. And so it has been somewhat uh, uh, divisive in, 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 in sure. some families. I think we have to... I'll probably get in trouble, but I think we have to be careful to dis- to announce that I and I alone understand all of it, and everybody should agree with me, because we seem to be different, <laughs> and we were raised in different homes. Now, I, you were talking about an oral tradition for a long time, which so much of what we have from the antiquities is that it was that in the, these other religions hinduism it's oral tradition for one or two thousand years confucianism same way and then eventually it gets written down uh, i always remember when i studied shintoism the japanese they they were influenced by confucian and they used to have what what I would call a friar, people that rode on a horse and went from place to place. And they they came down with two different people that were leaders, and so they have infiltrated, but they also have been incorporated in, in the Shintoism and uh, from two different understandings. I'm sure that's true. Yeah. Absolutely. And that actually is all kinds of things in our culture, not just church. Um, for sure. Y'all come on up now. <laughs> Had some cousins from Texas. We, we made a lot of fun of them when they came to Iowa. Because they didn't talk right. <laughs> okay, Christianity. I <clears throat> didn't think that we would spend a lot of time on that today because we're hearing a lot about it today. This is Easter. Um, <clears throat> yeah, you get the hang of this. Um, I need to go back out of this. How come it's not on the screen? Huh. Let's look at this, the earth then. Huh? For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That wasn't part of my presentation. (laughs) So, let me get this. I had this laid out. Jesus was born when? When do we think Jesus was born? (laughs) 
There's a lot of different opinions. Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Sometime around 4, 4 BCE or 1 CE, uh, and Jesus was crucified somewhere around 33 CE. Uh, I forget. They've changed it. Common era. Yeah. Yeah, it used to be AD and BC. Some scholars, I'm sure, decided we needed to update that. Um, so we have in 50 through 60 CE, Paul organized early Christians. It wasn't until 70 to 95 CE that the Gospels were written down. Which was the first of the New Testament books to be written? New Testament. Mark. A lot of people think Mark. In fact, some people think probably Matthew maybe used some of Mark to write some of his stuff down. And, and of course, Luke. Was Luke a Jew originally? I've, I've had some people argue that he was a Gentile, converted. But today, people are always throwing spears at everything. Uh, say he, I've always understood him to be a medical doctor, but I read some theologian said, well, he was probably a veterinarian. <laughs> I thought, oh, my gosh. <laughs> Very similar, probably. <laughs> uh, so it was uh, the last of the New Testament writings really weren't pulled together until about 150 CE timeline if you're looking at a timeline there's a, uh, of course it wasn't about 300 CE that, the, that all the different leaders got together to decide which books ought to be in the Bible and that caused quite a bit of uh, disagreement. And it came down to, was it men? There were, I don't think there were any women were allowed at that time. <laughs> but, but then it comes the question, what about the Holy Spirit? Could the Holy Spirit have been directing them to, to come together and to assemble it? Um, some people argue with that. However, has it stood the test of time? The New Testament? I, I think so. And some people would call it the, the words of life. We're in the New Testament. Jesus Christ, I remember uh, as a brand new Christian, I was a little skeptical yet. So I wanted to see if there was a Jesus who really lived. How do you do that? So I remember going on into an Encyclopedia Britannica looking to see about that time frame. And there's a guy named Josephus. Who was he? A historian. And he had mentioned in one of his writings at that time period that there were all kinds of stories about some guy in Galilee doing miracles and was crucified and raised. That was verification for me that if a historian back that far away knew about this and had written about it, that helped me immensely. Because I was still brand new. And trying to, to see whether I was uh, making a big mistake or not, I guess. I do know that with the incoming spirit of Christ in my life, which happened in February of 1976, if you really want to get down to it, I 
had a lift, lifting sensation of the weight of the world off my shoulders that I, I really, really appreciated. And it opened the door for me to think that God had tried to speak to me twice that I knew of distinctively, once when I was 12 and once when I was 17, that I was called to do ministry. And I didn't want to because it didn't look like a fun life to me. I mean, a lot of people were partying and having a wee of a time and that, like, oh, man, all the things I got to give up. <laughs> the thought, that was in my head. So when it happened, it happened profoundly. And then I, it, as I describe it, there was a hungering and the thirsting, and I think you can find it in Matthew 5, after righteousness, that I couldn't get enough of it. I harassed Carrie Lake every day for over a year. I was either in a Bible study well, by, the, by the end of that first year, I was also doing the youth leader and the and a sun, Sunday school class, too. But every day, I wanted to talk to Carrie, my pastor, because I had questions. And I imagine there were times when his eyes rolled when he saw who was calling, I'm sure. But it was huge. And he's the one that suggested I go with him to a Bible college one day just to see if I liked it. I'll never forget it because the day that I went with him to the Bible college at Venard, as they had a guest speaker, and he was a man who had been fighting cancer for, for a long time, and he had started a group about living for tomorrow. And it was getting, he'd written a book, and and it really hit me hard because I'd had a profound fear of death. And I thought to myself, why in the world would I have come here today to hear him talk about death and dying? It seemed like a real downer. <laughs> and I looked back on that and I thought, he spoke right to the heart of one of my biggest fears. And then once, once I gave myself over to the idea that I was called to ministry, I couldn't get enough. And uh, changed Joyce and I's life's trajectory. We each prayed to receive Christ as our Savior the same week without telling each other. And that was kind of important to find that out on the following Sunday. So it's a personal relationship. It isn't a bound by obedience to a law that we can't fulfill. I believe through the Holy Spirit, we can live the life Christ has called us to. We have to model it. We have to model it. By that I mean we need to live it. And we can do that with the Holy Spirit's help. Jesus Christ, what does it say in Revelation? Is the Alpha and Omega? The same yesterday, today, and forever. There are many examples that surround us of people who are also making that same walk. And we need each other. Uh, it can't be just about politics. It's got to be in the heart. The thing I think I preached on this a little bit, I used a, a picture 
of the James Webb Telescope on a sermon here because I used it for my brother's funeral a year ago. The farther we get out into the universe, the more questions you can have. When you see the unspeakable glory of colors and things we don't know, know and understand. I th naturally, in my mind, I keep going back to who the heck started all this? You ever think about that? Or we just accept it? Maybe I'm too complicated. <laughs> but eternity is a little hard to explain. By faith, we accept it. I was supposed to be done in time for a choir to practice, I think. Are we done now? Are you, uh, are you having another practice yet? Okay, okay. Let's have a word of prayer today. Gracious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this is a full day of celebration. It's really busy for the people who work in the church. But we want to worship you and lift up everyone that walks through the door to receive you, Lord, as Savior. We pray this in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.